Well, if you have a Bible this morning, let's open up to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Again, if you have no idea where Matthew is, feel free to use the table of contents up front. We're going to be in the New Testament, actually the first book in the New Testament. So it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in the gospel accounts. And again, if you're here, I know first of the year, there's a lot of people that may come that are maybe trying to reconnect with the church somehow or you know, uh, think about maybe reading your Bible more or praying more. Um, if you are unfamiliar with how the Bible works, it's actually pretty simple. Number one, the Bible is not about you. And the whole Old Testament says, somebody's coming, somebody's coming. This promised one's coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that are gospel accounts, they say, somebody's here right now. Then the whole rest of the New Testament from Acts forward says, somebody's coming again. Who is that someone? It is the promised Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible is, a, is not a story about you and what you should be doing. It is a story about God and what he has done. Although there's do's and don'ts in the Bible, but it's primarily a story about God and what he has done. And so this morning we're looking at Matthew, which is a gospel account, and that says somebody's here right now. So we're looking at the life and ministry of Jesus. And as you're kind of opening up there to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 5 through 15. So if you're unfamiliar with how to find things in the Bible, you find the book first, then you find the big number 6, that's the chapter that we're in. Then you find the little number five, and that's the verse number that we're going to start in, if you're unfamiliar with how the Bible works. And I don't know if you've seen the show that's on uh, Netflix or heard it about it. It's called Chef's Table, and it's a really interesting show. Each episode focuses on one particular chef and the unique style of cooking or cuisine that kind of put them on the map. And you kind of just spend a little bit of time hearing about their story and where they come, came from and why they fix the food that they do and the way that they do. And every episode includes a look into the background of a particular chef, and without fault, there is typically one thing in common. Typically, these now famous chefs at one time started out as the dishwasher working for another famous chef at some point. They started in the back of house doing the most lowly of things, but that was to get their foot in the door. They started out washing dishes, and they learned the restaurant trade and learned uh, how a kitchen runs before they ever got to the point where they were actually prepping food themselves. And along the way, they learned a lot of techniques. They learned how different flavors and textures interact. They learned all facets of the in industry, and they also learned how to successfully run a small business and lead a staff and just all the ins and outs of running a restaurant, and they started out as a dishwasher. And they spent multiple years watching and learning or imitating someone else before they ever dreamed of opening their own restaurant. Even then, around 60% of all new restaurants close within the first year and only 80% make it to their fifth anniversary. And so these aspiring chefs were drawn to these mentors because they were the best in the business. And one of the things that they did is they made something that was really difficult actually look really easy. You ever been around anybody like that? You ever been around somebody like that or drawn to somebody like that? Someone who is so good at a particular thing that you just kind of want to learn from them. You kind of wish you could spend a little time and say, hey, teach me how you do that. Show me how you do that. I've had people like that. For example, for me, I love to play golf. I'm not good at it, but I love to play. Some of you who also play golf know that that's typically the struggle. And I love watching Fred Couples swing. It's just this effortless swing. And it looks like he swings so easy, but yet is just absolutely drilling the ball. And it's sometimes like I, I watch Fred Couples swing videos, and sometimes I wish I, I wish I could just spend an hour with him and say, Fred, teach me. Show me what you do here. Even though I know full well that even after I spent that hour with him, I'm still going to snap hook my tee shots directly into the woods. Although I'll have a cool story to tell. But if I'm honest with myself, I know that ball's going hard left off the tee every single time. It seems to be my lot in life, but that's okay. That's what, that's what makes golf great. It just beats us to a pulp, and then we hit that one good shot, and we're like, yeah, I think I'll come back tomorrow. And you think about that, like we're all instinctively drawn to the best in a particular field, and wish, we wish that we had the chance to learn from them directly. You ever thought about how that might actually apply to your spiritual life? Imagine having access to Jesus during his earthly ministry face-to-face, -face, and you had the ability to ask him questions. What would you ask him? What would you want to learn? 
If you had Jesus in the flesh there, what would you ask him? What would you want to learn? And would you have the humility and teachability to actually listen and try? You think about in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, one of, Luke, one of Jesus' disciples came to him and basically made a request slash asked him a question. And the request was this, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us how to do that. Teach us how to pray. They obviously recognized that prayer was a vital part of Jesus' life, and they wanted to learn how to pray as they were also being shaped by his life and ministry, as they were following him around and learning from him. And so in both Luke 11 and the parallel account in Matthew 6 that we're going to read this morning, Jesus taught them what is now referred to as the Lord's Prayer. Here's what Al Mohler said. Al Mohler said this, The Lord's Prayer takes less than 20 seconds to read out loud, but it takes a lifetime to learn. That's a good quote. Takes less than 20 seconds to read out loud, but a lifetime to learn. And so this morning, whether you are very familiar with prayer, if you have absolutely no idea what prayer is, if you wish that you prayed more, if you're somewhere in between, let's all join the disciples and learn from Christ together as he teaches us because we all have something to learn. None of us have arrived. We all have something to learn from this prayer. And who better to learn it from than the second person of the Trinity himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's look to God's word this morning. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. Let's give attention to the reading of God's word. I'm going to read out of the ESV, but whatever translation you have is great. I'd rather read, you read out of the one that you have than worry about that you've got the wrong one. Let's give attention to the reading of God's word. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The grass withers. And the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. I'm grateful for that, and I hope you are as well. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help as we look to his word. Please pray with me. Father, as we come before you with our Bibles open, we pray that our hearts would also be open to receive your word with gladness and humility. Redescribe reality to us this morning as we are so quick to forget. We are grateful, O oh Lord, that you've not left us alone to figure life out. You've given us your word. You've given us your Holy Spirit, and you've given us each other. And so, Father, may we sit at your feet in the next few moments and learn from you. And, Father, may we praise you in all that we do. We ask these things humbly in Christ's precious name. Amen. Now, it's interesting when you look at this very familiar prayer, and you may have grown up saying it like I grew up Methodist, and we said this every single week, along with singing the Gloria Patri and all the other various things that go along with that. When you look at these verses, it's easy to think that this is really all that Christians are supposed to pray. And there are some people that think, well, this is really the only prayer you're allowed to pray, so to speak. No more, no less. But thankfully, this is not true. The Lord's Prayer is actually very rich and very deep. There's a lot going on here in this text. And hopefully over the next few weeks, we're going to kind of unpack it a little bit. And it opens actually a lot of doors for us. It's a, it's a very rich prayer, as you can imagine, coming from Jesus himself. And when you think about this prayer, many of the historic reformed creeds and confessions that have been around for hundreds of years actually devote a significant amount of time and space to it. So I mentioned earlier that the shorter catechism devotes the final nine questions to the Lord's Prayer, while the larger catechism and the Heidelberg catechism devote the final 11 questions to this prayer and kind of unpack it. When you think about in the history of a confession and the space that you have there, that's a lot of real estate to spend on this one thing. And so it obviously is important and it obviously matters and has mattered in the history of the church. And you think, why in the world is that true? Why is this thing so important? 
There's a fancy Latin phrase for those of you who like that kind of thing. It's lex oriandi, lex credendi. And what that means is as we pray, we believe. As we pray, we believe. Again, here's what Al Mohler said. Our theology is never so clearly displayed before our eyes and before the world as in our prayers. Praying forces us to articulate our doctrines, convictions, and theological assumptions. In in short, prayer discloses much about us. Historically, this prayer has been divided into six petitions, and they ask God to do something. That's what a petition is. God, we're asking you, would you please do this? And you look in your, even your confession this morning, confession of faith, we said, what does the preface and the first petition of the Lord's Prayer teach us? And so we're going to look at the preface and the first petition this morning. Kevin DeYoung, who wrote an incredibly helpful book on the Lord's Prayer that came out not too long ago. I'll bring it for show and tell next week. It's in my office. I forgot. Little teeny little paperback book. Very easy to access. It's a, it's a helpful little book. Um, also, Sproul wrote a really helpful book on the Lord's Prayer as well. Here's what DeYoung said about it. He said, the first set of three requests focus on God's glory, his name, his kingdom, and his will. The second set of three requests focus on our good, our provision, our forgiveness, and our protection. And so this morning, as far as a big question, as we begin our sermon series on this prayer, we're going to ask the question, what can we learn from the preface and the first petition of the Lord's Prayer? What can we learn from it, and how does it point us to the gospel? We're going to see two points this morning if you're a note-taking type of person. We're going to see, number one, the foundation of our prayers, and number two, the desire of our prayers. So the foundation of our prayers, and then the desire of our prayers as we look at this. So let's look at that first point. The foundation of our prayers, and this is basically the preface, our Father in heaven. And as you know, our passage this morning, you may know, lies at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And this lies at the very heart of it. And the first thing we notice is that prayer is assumed as a normal part of life with God. You see in verse 5, it says, and when you pray, not if, when you pray, do this. It's just kind of assumed that prayer is a normal part of life with the Lord. But then Jesus gave his disciples, and by default today, us who also walk in his footsteps, Two categories of how not to pray. Did you notice that in the lead up to the Lord's Prayer itself? He says, and when you pray, don't pray like this. And he gives us two categories. Number one, he says, don't be like the hypocrites in verses 5 and 6. And then don't be like the pagans in verses 7 through 8. And the first category is handled by way of a contrast dealing with who you're really praying for. The Greek word translated hypocrite there is a theatrical word for, think about somebody who's wearing a mask, who's play acting. That's what that Greek word means, hypocrites. It means someone who's wearing a mask. And the first category is handled in this way. And here's what Sproul said about it. Jesus applied the word to people who were going through the motions of prayer, making a great external show of piety, but whose real state did not match the outward show. Jesus was primarily referencing the Pharisees of his day who loved to dress up in very religious garb and pray out loud for the attention of others and the admiration of others. You think about the the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee comes and he prays out loud so that everybody could hear him. Oh Lord, thank you that I am not like this tax collector. I tithe and I give and I do all of this kind of stuff, this kind of outward show of piety. And as we know in that parable, The tax collector could not even lift his eyes up to heaven and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, which one of those do you think went home justified? It's the one who recognized his sin. And you think about what's going on here. It's still a danger for us today. We can do all the right things for all the wrong reasons, and we can look very religious while we do it. Again, DeYoung said this, Our prayer life should be like the iceberg in the ocean with a great mass of spirituality under the surface that no one can see. He said, be like the iceberg with a great mass underneath. He said, don't be like the iceberg lettuce that floats on the top. And that's all there is to it. Christ is not condemning praying in public or praying corporately with other believers. Those are not sinful things to do. If they are, we're already in big trouble this morning. We've done all of that. Thankfully, Jesus is not talking about that. What Jesus is condemning is doing, doing religious stuff publicly so that others will see you and applaud you for it without any sincere devotion to God. What he's basically saying is you're doing that stuff so that others will worship you. You're taking your eye off the ball. 
Verse 7, though, gives us another category of prayer to be avoided. It says, when you also pray, don't pray uh, like the Gentiles. Don't heap up empty phrases. And Gentiles there is just another word for non-believers, pagans. And the Greek word translated empty phrases there is batalageo, which means babbling. And this refers to just mindlessly saying the words to complete a task. Just kind of going through the motions, check, I did that. I don't have any real thought of God going through my mind at all. I'm just going through the motions. And the King James Version, if he has that, translates it vain repetitions, which I think is actually a really helpful translation of that word. is spiritual ritual with no thought of God. And again, DeYoung was really helpful on this. He said, the goal in prayer is not the completion of some mechanical ritual. That's not the goal of prayer. It's just get it done, check it off, move on. And so when we think about that, how are we to pray? If it's not like this, if it's not like that, well, then how are we to pray? That's the big question. And verse 6 gives us a window into the true heart of prayer. Look at verse 6. It says, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. Again, the Heidelberg Catechism is actually super helpful on the Lord's Prayer. If you've never dialogued or read that before, the Heidelberg's wonderful and great. And here's what the Heidelberg Catechism said, uh, and it asked the question, question 16, if you're taking notes. It says, why is prayer necessary for Christians? Why is prayer necessary for Christians? What a great question. Here's the answer. Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness which God requires of us, Moreover, God will give His grace and the Holy Spirit only to those who constantly and with heartfelt longing ask Him for these gifts and thank them for Him. Simply put, we pray out of a thankful heart, in humble reliance upon God's grace, with a recognition of our own spiritual weakness according to the will of God for His glory, not ours. Prayer is not about impressing anyone. It's about coming before the Lord with humility and trusting in his good heart and also trusting in his perfect, sovereign, and good will. We don't, pray God, we don't pray to change God's mind. We pray and ask that God would change us. We say, Lord, help me to be more like your son. Lord, help me, change me, work in me, O Lord. And now finally, after all of that, we finally arrive at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer in verse 9. Don't worry, all that previous stuff was baked into the cake. I'm watching the clock. We look at that in, in verse 9, and the first two words are incredibly hopeful when we think about the foundation of our prayer. Think about how this prayer starts. It starts with our Father. Our Father. Very unique, very distinct, especially in world religions. And we think about this. Verse 9 starts off and lays out that foundation. You will notice this is very familial language. This is not, oh, your most glittering, high, resplendent one. No, it's our Father. It's very familial in its language, and that means everything, and it's incredibly hopeful for those of us who trust in Christ as Savior because it points to this new relationship that we have with the Holy God. We're no longer enemies of His. We're His children, and we come and say, Our Father. It's incredibly hopeful. We are, we are uh, we are part of his family. But did you also notice that it doesn't say my father? It's our father. That reminds us that this relationship is also corporate in nature. That it's not just all about us. That there is a we, an our component to this prayer when we come before the Lord. And that is good for us to remember. That because of Christ, we've been justified by grace through faith. And now have a new relationship with God. We're no longer his enemies. We are his family. And that means everything. Again, here's what DeYoung said. To pray with intimacy to God as Father is not a human right. It is a spiritual privilege. It is not our natural human birthright to call God Father. It is our born-again spiritual birthright. You ever thought about that? How amazing that is that you can pray, Our Father? Think about every other world religion's concept of God. He's this far off, unapproachable, you can't know him. He's completely apart from you, and you better act right or else. And the Christian concept of God is saying, you can't act right. <laughs> That's why you need a savior. And that savior has made you right. And because of that, you now have a new family, a new hope. You are adopted. You are a child of the almighty God. And you can come to him and call him father. It's amazing. We're two words in. 
when you think about that. Just the weight of that should just hang with us there. That it is a spiritual birthright of those who are born again by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That you can come and call God Father. It's amazing when you think about it. But if you are here and you do not trust Christ, you don't have that familial language. God is not your Father. You stand under Him as a judge and so again, I call you as a minister in Christ as we have already confessed our sin and we've already looked. We've got to remember who God is. He's holy, holy, holy. And because of our sin, we're not, not, not. And that leaves us with a big problem. And if you're here today and you think that you can do it all on your own and you don't need Jesus, then God is not your father. He is your judge. And I'm warning you to flee from the wrath to come and look to Christ because it is only through Christ that because of Christ, you can now, instead of being his enemy, you can be part of his family and adopted by grace. It's amazing. It's the hope of the gospel. Because we're praying to God our Father, it means we don't have to impress anybody. And thoughts of our own earthly father, when you think about our father, that might bring to mind some very unpleasant thoughts. At some point, all human fathers fail. I know that instinctively. I am a human father, and I am a failure. And if you are here and you're a father, or you had a father, they were probably failures too. At some point, all of our human fathers fail. And we hear that word, and sometimes it brings up and conjures up, you know, thoughts of disappointment or abandonment or whatever it is. But here's the thing. God the Father is not like us, and I am grateful for that. I'm grateful that God the Father is not like me. Because I know that I can be flippant. I know that I can get angry. I know that I can lose it. And I am grateful that God the Father is not like me. He's not like the Father I am. And He's not like the Father that you are or the Father that you had. God is not like us. He will never fail us. His love is sure and perfect. His protection and provision is sure. And so because of that, we can come honestly before God with all of our fears, with all of our doubts, with all of our failures, with all of our worries, with all of our guilt, with all of our shame, we can come before Him and feel like we don't have to hide. And we can come before Him, we can lay our hearts bare before Him and trust in His good heart and rest in His love and say, Father, I messed up. I messed up again. And know that God the Father, because of Christ, loves you. And it, what it does is it opens us up to not have to feel like we need to take a spiritual shower before we come to the Lord in prayer. We just come and say, Father, please hear my prayer. Here, I messed up again. I did it again. I'm sorry. Look at verse 8. Did you notice this, pro this promise that's here in verse 8? God knows what we need before we even ask Him. And He already loves us. And so we have the great privilege through the sacrifice of Christ in our union with him of being able to approach God with confidence and assurance of being part of his family and just talk to him, knowing that he hears us. God knows what we need before we even ask him. And it's said before that the only person that can confidently walk into the king's throne room at any moment and ask for something is his own kid. Everybody else has to bow and do the, you know, do the whole um, you know, lead up when you think about human royalty. You know, who are you to enter the king's chamber? The only one who can do that is his own kid. He just comes in and goes, Dad, I need a cup of water. All right. Glad to see you. And you also remember, though, when we think about this, that familial language, but it's also balanced with something else. Because we also need to remember who we're talking to. And we use the terms that he gives us. Again, here's what DeYoung said. We have no warrant to pray to God in ways that we think might sound better or more culturally attuned or the world thinks are more appropriate. You hear people now, and especially more of the progressive wings, and they're saying, God, our mother, and changing God's pronouns. We do not have the right to change God's pronouns, and that is blasphemy to do it. We call him how he has said to be called, and, his, and the amazing thing, he says, I'm father. So we don't get the right to change God's pronouns just because we think the world's going to clap for us a little bit. I would rather avoid the golf clap of the world and be okay with God the Father and, and being on his terms. And so it is blasphemy, utter blasphemy, 
to change what God has clearly said, call me this. And we got to stand against that. We can't let that go. We need to say, no, that's not, that's blasphemy. Stop. We pray to the Holy One, Triune, Living, Sovereign, Almighty God of the universe, who by sheer grace alone has drawn us near and adopted us. He's transcendent, he's high, he's lifted up, but yet because of the gospel and because of Christ, he's near, he's imminent, he's with us. Both of those things are true. It's amazing. And so we pray with hope and confidence as God's children, but we also pray with reverence and humility before Almighty God. But with that as the foundation of our prayer, what are we to pray for? So God, our Father, what are we to pray for? Our Father in heaven, second point, shorter than the first. The desire of our prayers, which is the first perdition, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, foundation of our prayers, hallowed be your name, first petition. As many of you know, the shorter catechism begins with a very important question. It's kind of like the why are we here kind of question. It asks the question, what's the chief end of man? What's life all about? Why are we here? And it answers the question with man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. It's a wonderful way to start the catechism because everything else flows from that question. And in the business world, this is known as a mission statement or a guiding principle. It's the one thing that holds everything else in the organization together. You know, what are we about? What's the guiding thing that affects every other decision that's going to follow? And so we ask the question, what's the guiding principle of the Lord's Prayer? It's the hallowing of God's name. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me. I don't use the word hallow in my normal everyday conversation. You might be familiar with that word even just from like you know, the Deathly Hallows from Lord's Prayer or, or from the Harry Potter series, or you grew up saying this, hallowed be thy name, and you have no idea what that means. What that is, hallow, is not an exclamation of praise. It's actually an appeal. Define the word hallow means to honor as holy. And so in an appeal, it would be help me to honor your name as holy. Hallowed be your name. Help me to do that, O Lord. Again, DeYoung, he said, To hallow means may the world and all created things see God for who he is and may his human creatures especially adore and obey him. And here's what Calvin said. We would wish God to have the honor he deserves that men should never think of him without the highest reverence. And we've all heard God slandered and caricatured out in the world, calling him a cosmic child abuser, which is utter blasphemy calling him the great sky daddy. I had somebody say that to me. He's just, it can't be a great sky daddy. Or some egomaniac who always has to be worshiped. You know, we've heard God slandered out in the world, or worse yet, we've heard God's name being used as a slur or as a curse word. And as Christians, we hear God's name being slandered and blasphemed, and it naturally bothers us because we think, that's not the God I worship. It's not my God. Don't use my God's name that way. That's not who he is. And deep down, we pray that God would change their hearts so that they could see God for who he truly is and that their slander would be changed to worship. That's our prayer. We don't only do evangelism and outreach just because God commands us to, although that's a great reason in and of itself. We do evangelism and missions because we want the entire globe to be filled with the worship and glory of God from all nations, tribes, and tongues. That's what we want, for God's name to be hallowed and revered and honored across the entire globe. That's, what, that's our desire. I had somebody ask me, why do Christians do all of this crazy stuff trying to reach out the world? I said, well, number one, we don't do it because you know, we think we're the best at it, because obviously we're not. One of the things, the reason why we do that is because we want our lost neighbors to know Jesus and the gospel that has changed our life. We want them out of a deep desire for them to truly know. We really want you to know. That's why we do it. But we don't pray this out of our own sense of superiority. We do it from a sense of our own understanding of just how unworthy we actually are. And we do it from a sense of just how gracious and kind God has been to us first. And this is the reason that this is the first petition. Okay, so we said, our Father in heaven, that's the foundation. And then the first petition, which we ask him, hallowed be your name. There's a reason that this is the first petition. It puts all of the following petitions in the proper order. 
Because it starts with asking God to help us glorify his name and honor him in all that we do because he's worthy of it. The scary part about this prayer, though, and the scary part about this petition is we're asking God to start with us first. We're going to get into thy kingdom come, woo, thy will be done. We're asking, oh God, hallowed be your name. But not everybody else. Start with me first. Start with us first, please. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I know that sounds so overwhelming, but we know that with the Spirit's help, He helps us in to do this. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. How do we do that? Lots of ways. That was, that's what makes life fun. We glorify and enjoy God in lots of different ways. And we don't like that, though, when we hear it, because he says, we're asking God to start with us first. We don't like that, because if we're really honest, we want our names to be hallowed, don't we? We want to be honored. We want to do what we do for the glory of us. We want to build a legacy for ourselves. We think about how many times, how much time and effort and devotion do we spend to, how can I make a name for myself so that people will remember me after I'm gone? When really, the goal of the Christian life is to live a faithful life unto the glory of Christ and then die anonymously and go into glory for the glory of God. The Lord's Prayer does something really interesting here. It pushes back on that desire for us to hallow our own names. It pushes back on that and reminds us of the only one who is worthy of praise. And spoiler alert, it's not us. For the glory of God. Think about this. Why in the world that sounds so, you know, like, well, God gets to take all the credit. That sounds so like, God, why, why do you get to take all the credit? Okay, let me give you a couple of examples. Okay, so God the Father, who's the one who sent his one and only son into the world to live the righteous life that we could never live on our own and to die the death for sin and rebellion on the cross that we all deserved. And instead of leaving us in our sin, he, by the Holy Spirit called us from spiritual death into spiritual life, showed us our sin, and then gave us the gifts of repentance and saving faith, and then showed us the glory of Christ in the gospel. God has done all of that to gather his people to himself. I'm okay if he gets all the credit for that. There's nothing worthy or creditable in me at all. He found me when I was at my worst and showed his grace to me and called me unto himself while I was shaking my fist at him as an enemy. And the gospel's never going to make sense to you until you realize that you're the bad guy in the story. And that he has given you everything you need by sheer grace and mercy alone. That while you were at your worst, he loved you with the best. And he's called you to himself. I mean, think about this great promise. We who once were not a people are now a people by grace. That God is in the business of gathering his redeemed and his elect from every corner of the globe, from all nations, tribes, and tongues, and not a single one of them deserved it. And that's why we come here on Sunday and I don't give you a checklist of 20 things to go be a better Christian. Because you're going to mess it up. I don't give you 10 ways to be a better father. You're going to mess it up. 10 ways to be a better mother. You're going to mess it up. All I offer you and all we offer you is Jesus. That's it. It's the fastball. Look to Christ. Trust in Christ. Rest in Christ. I say I got one pitch. New year. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw the same pitch. Trust in Christ. Look to Christ. Rest in Christ. Rest in the gospel. Rest in his love and his grace and his mercy. None of which you earned but was freely given to you by grace alone. When that gets into your bones, it changes your life. It does. It changes the way you see everything. Because what it does is it takes the eye off of you. And what it allows you to do is get over yourself. And to say, not to me, O Lord. Not to me, but to your name be the glory. Everything we do for your glory. And I'm okay if you get the credit for it. I'm good with that. Psalm 115, 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. So we think about the foundation of our prayer. God, our Father in heaven. It's an amazing promise. Hallowed be your name from everlasting to everlasting because he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And may he, O oh Lord, when we think about hallowed be your name, may he start with us first. 
Start with us first, O Lord. That's our prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how rich and deep this prayer is, as we're just a few words in. And Lord, it is a great privilege to be able to come to you and call you our Father, that you have redeemed and reclaimed and restored a people from all nations, tribes, and tongues unto yourself. And you are continuing that work, and you will continue that work until the day of your return. And so in the meantime, help us to lean into your promises, trust that your word is true. Help us to lean into this new relationship because of Christ and Christ alone, that we who were once your enemies are now your people. We who were at once far off have been now been adopted into your family by sheer grace alone. May that take our breath away when we think about it. Forgive us, O Lord, for all the ways that we're trying to keep some glory back for ourselves. Help us to repent of that and turn to you. Cast all of our glory before you because you alone are worthy of it. Father, we do pray that your name would be hallowed throughout the globe. We do long for that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Until that day, O Lord, help us to be faithful to go and share the good news. Help us to be faithful to the Great Commission to go and talk to our neighbors, talk to our family, go overseas, wherever you might call us, O Lord, to share the good news of the hope of the gospel, which is not a checklist, but a person. And so, Father, help us to rest in that. In the meantime, please build us up, strengthen us. Lord, we're grateful that you have even taught us how to pray. And so, Father, we pray that you would, by your grace, help us to be like that iceberg, a great and wide foundation underneath the surface that no one can see, but driven by a heart of gratitude, grace, and love, and mercy because of all that you've done. Hallowed be your name. That's our prayer. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.